All right, I think we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome everyone to another installment of our Provost's Distinguished Speaker Series for this academic year. My name is Jeffrey Schulson, and I serve as the Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. The Provost's Distinguished Speaker Series is an annual event where we invite our recently appointed Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professors, and Endowed Chairs to share their scholarship with us. We're very pleased to share this opportunity to bring our community together even if it's by screens, in appreciation and celebration of the exceptional work we do at UConn. Earlier this week, we were finally able to hold an in-person reception on the Storrs campus to celebrate the five distinguished professors named in 2021. And we want to thank everyone who was able to attend to honor the awardees. Today, we will hear from Dr. Minghui Chen, professor and head of the Department of Statistics in the College of Liberal, of Liberal Arts and Sciences. His talk is titled Power Prior, an approach for leveraging real-world evidence in statistical inference and designs of clinical trials. I'd like to thank Dr. Chen in advance for sharing his scholarship with us. It is our custom for these lectures to ask the fac faculty members dean formally to introduce the speaker. So to tell you more about the accomplishments of Dr. Chen, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Julie Wade, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and Professor of Psychological Sciences. I have had the pleasure of working with Dean Wade since she arrived at UConn about three years ago. CLS, CLAS is by far the largest of our academic units, nearly the size of every other school and college combined. Dean Wade's commitment to the college, to her faculty and staff, and to the students is evident in everything she does, whether it's rethinking the most effective approach to promoting the wide array of academic programs offered by CLAS, or ensuring that our students are receiving the support they need and deserve especially during these particularly trying times of the pandemic. I feel honored to call Julie my colleague, and I'm delighted to turn the floor over to her so that she can introduce our speaker. Well, thanks, Jeffrey, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, at least virtually today. Um, so I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Uh, Ming is a professor and the head of statistics in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. He's a world-renowned expert in Bayesian statistics, design of clinical trials, and meta-analysis. He's uh, stunningly published more than 400 peer-reviewed articles and five books, um, and these include two advanced graduate-level books on Bayesian survival analysis and Monte Carlo methods. Um, his statistical methods have been implemented in software programs, including SAS and R, uh, and he's been cited by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. And his research has changed clinical practice in the U.S. and abroad in a range of areas, including the management of prostate cancer and also complications from its treatment. At UConn, uh, Dr. Chen was the Director of Statistical Consulting Services for more than a decade. He supervised 37 PhD students, and he's trained more than 100 uh, other graduate students through statistical consulting and collaborative research. He's the past president of the International Chinese Statistical Association and also the New England Statistical Society. And he's currently a co-editor in chief of the journal Statistics and its Interface and the New England Journal of Statistics and Data Science. In addition to his many international awards here at UConn, he has received the AUP Research Excellence Award, the CLAS, um, Excellence in Research Award and the Yukon Alumni Association's University Award for Faculty Excellence in Research and Creativity. So it's quite a list of honors there. Please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Ming Chen. Okay, thank you. So should I share screen first? I think I should get a full screen. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Jeffrey, for very warm for welcome remarks. And uh, thanks to Julie for a nice introduction. And also thank you, the Provost Office, for giving me the opportunity to speak in Prestigious Provost Distinguished Speaker Series. <clears throat> So today I want to 
pick up, actually I try to pick up one of the topic uh, in, the, in, in my life long research. And uh, this one area is last almost about 30 years for now. So I want to give the, the perspective of the type of research I have done, and I try not to get too technical, but in the meanwhile, you know, being statistician, I want to give a little bit of mathematics during my presentation. So the title will be the power play and approach for leveraging real world evidence in statistical influence and the designs of the clinical trials. So it's a four part of my presentation. So first one will talk about how to leverage historical data and the second one for design clinical trial and give us one real case study. And uh, I will conclude my presentation with the recent research on power plant. So the historical data are often available in clinical trials, uh, genetics, healthcare, psychology, environmental health, engineering, economics, and business. You know, in medical devices, so historical data are often available from previous trials, and only from the control device, because a new device, we even do not have any data available, so that's typical. And also in pediatric real cancer study, so the data from adult, adult patients may be available, and in also in real disease setting, an efficient standard of care, we call S, is already on the market. So therefore, the historical data are available for the treatment of standard care. So an early review article, you know, so I, I was wondering also to look actually to discuss the formalization of the power play as a general play for various classes of regression models. This is our 2000 statistical science paper. And in 2016, so we looked at another article to establish the relationship between the power plot and the very popular called heretical or in, in social science, they call multi level models. And uh, after our first review article, actually the power plot becomes extremely popular and there's so much more developed after our review article. So we so the second review article in 2015. So this article actually give an A to Z expositions of the power play and its application to the date. And the power play has emerged as a useful class of informative price for variety of situations in which the historical data are available. So, so here are the three articles I mentioned. So one in statistical science and one in basic analysis, another one in statistical medicine. <clears throat> and surprisingly, the 2015 paper was quite a mathematical. I, I, we, we did, I didn't expect you know, statistical medicine that took uh, the paper right away. Yeah, so that paper was published really, really fast. Your yeah, from submission to in print less than one year. So these are few selected early papers on power I have done. And uh, so the 1998 JASA paper was uh, one of my oldest paper involved the power play. And the second paper was published in 1998 in the biometrics. So that's actually, you know, I using the power play technique of how to make a statistical inference for human chain data. So actually I involved the genomic data in quite early in our work. And in 1999, so we utilized the power plant technique, you know, how to make a more powerful influence for survival data with the surviving fraction. And this paper, 1999 paper, is very well cited right now. It's one of kind of a fundamental article for survival data analysis in basic approach. And in another paper, we wrote a quite influential because how to use the power plant to do the variable selection. And also in 1999, so this work with Professor Day, another body discussion professor, we wrote, uh, you know, how to utilize the pipeline to analyze categorical data, which also published in JASA. So, so this is actually five paper, actually is trying to lay out a very good foundation for me to get a tenure when I'm promoting to associate professor at the time. But because JASA is one of the best statistical journal and JASA B also as well. So if you get uh, three JASA paper in one year, that's uh, 
two or three years was pretty good. So I want brief go through the basic setting for the pulp, right? So let the data from the column study will be denoted by D. We have a sample size with response variable called Y, and we have a covariance called design matrix called X. And once we have data, so being statistician, we want to write out what distribution of data would be, which we call the likelihood. And uh, we suppose uh, actually would not require the exact same structure, which are for simplicity for presentation, we assume the historical data shares the same structure. You have sample size, we call A now, we have response variable, we call outcome, we call Y now, and we have the covariance vectors, we call design matrix X now. And uh, so the basic procedure is iterative procedure. We start with some initial knowledge, we call initial pi, which is called pi now of the C. C is the parameter, something we're interested to make an inference about the population. So we start with initial pi, and now we will go, go through the power plus setting and integrate the prior knowledge from the historical data. And that will make feed into the current data to make a much more, much more powerful statistical inference. So the power plus because what's called power, you just the black hole is announced power. So really simple. And we start with initial plot. We integrate the data all together in very simple form. So the, the simplicity actually make a power price very attractive. So this power has a very nice property and the power price has very different names. So some people call this a discounting parameter and some people call this a precision parameter. And this is the parameter reflects the heterogeneity or compatibility you know, between the current and historical data. And because of the form of the power price, so we really don't want to the historical data to overshadow the current data, which you know, we're going to collect currently. So it's kind of makes sense we restrict the power between zero to one. And so the, the mathematically, so the A now really control the heaviness of the tails of the prime of the theta. So if if the A now getting smaller and the tail will become heavier. I will show some more illustration in a second. So once we have the power price established, so the posterior distribution, you really just multiply by the likelihood function given the current data. So which is in the form in the last line. So now I give some more illustration, but still have a lot of formulas mathematically. I, I think the data with the 200 subjects from the logistic regression model. So really binary response data. And the reason I only have single covariance. The reason I only use a single covariance is because I can the draw picture in 3D plots. And so the power plot is a raise the power. If we initial plot for the regression coefficient is uniform, and then you will see the counter plots of the power, the, the plot distribution of the two regression coefficients. And you can see from the left to the right, when the power is small, your counter is more kind of spread out which means the distribution have lots of variability. And when the power gets higher, I even put a 0.5, you know, 0.5, and you can see the contents that getting very, very small. So which means the distribution has a lot more information. And the most beauty things you can see here, the center of the distribution never change. So the power plant will maintain the same center, only change the spreading of distribution. And this plot actually is very desirable in statistical inference. So now for the little mathematics, right? So, so, so this formula I derived yesterday. I hope I don't have a mistake. So, so I put a little bit more challenge, you know, put it myself, and uh, I, I do in the normal regression model, which we usually teach in, in our applied statistical one. And we may introduce this one in, I think, it's that uh, 1000 or 1100 with. We we'll talk about the regression model. So now I put a little bit more mathematics, put everything in the notation of the vector and the matrix. So the, the likelihood of function giving the historical data. So for the parameter, we have two, two parts of parameter. One is the regression coefficient called beta, one is to capture the variability of the data called sigma square. So the likelihood of function can be decomposed into two parts. This is really called a novel decomposition in the regression framework. So the first part is to capture the location of the regression coefficient giving the variability parameter called sigma square. 
And the second part is really sum of the residual square. So, so this one called SSE zero. So this really can capture the variability we have in the data. And this have a nicely edited. So that's really called nice a novel decomposition. And I, I will show you in the next couple of slides, you know, why I want to separate the two parts. That actually has a very nice like, inference <coughs> calculations. And suppose the valence is known. And then the, the nice part about the, 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 the power the power plant distribution of the regulation coefficient is really standard normal with the center as a least square estimate of beta zero hat. And with the valence is just really, it, it's the, the valence of the beta zero hat if we start with uniform prior for regression coefficient. And, and from this formula, the global statistician will understand it better. So the smaller A naught is, the larger the prior valence will be. And so over years, uh, we develop uh, all different type of uh, variation of power ply. So one variation we call the partial borrowing power ply. So what a concept of this? So this is the first time, you know, when when I work on one of the, 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 the application paper, which published in 2012 in biometrics. And we also developed uh, use this same technique uh, in 2014 biometrics paper. They call partial borrowing power ply. So the idea is suppose the Kisora data and the current data share only part of parameter. See, if they only share common regression coefficient beta, while the valences are different. So valence for current data called sigma square and valences for historic data called H sigma H square. Then the partial borrowing power price will only borrow the information they share in common. So which means I only borrow information by beta, but not for the valence parameter. So what do we do? We want to integrate out. Actually, I, I had the, the typo. I should have raised the A naught power. I forgot the A naught power. The power should be A naught here. Sorry, I forgot the, the A naught power. I looked at this formula last night, but too late. So, so the idea is our integrate out developers, yeah, not shared. I only bought the information for the parameter we share. So, so that's the idea. And uh, as a result, what happening, you know, this technique gives us the, the plot distribution of the beta really follow into p-dimensional multivariate distribution instead of normal distribution if they share common balances. So what it means is the plot information will be less because you get a much heavier tail distribution for the regression coefficient, which makes a lot of sense. And uh, much more recently, so this paper was published in 2021, just the last year, with my recent students uh, one in a year. So we deal with the things, I, I put a more general formula than the paper, that the formula was put in that paper. So what we do is we want to borrow the regression coefficient data and the variability data differently, right? So why we should borrow in same weight, right? We, we could have, I may borrow the regression coefficient data, say 50%, I may borrow variance parameter only 20%. So this technique allows us to do that. So they call borrowing by parts of power ply. And the partial reason we can do that is because we're, we're building for a novel decomposition for normal, under normal regression model. So that's what's the power of the original decomposition, which allow us to borrow the different part of data in different ways. So, so it's a very nice, beautiful feature. Okay, so second part I want to talk about, uh, you know, how the, the power plant play a role in the design of, you know, in, in the design of the clinical trial. And all this work actually is starting from this FDA guidance. And the draft that this guidance was published in 2006. And at that time, you know, a group of statisticians from Boston Scientific came to UConn to attend the, the one of the symposium I organized. And I myself also offered the shorter courses. And they like my shorter course, they offered me the projects. And so I involved the, the design of their medical device. So that's where all the started in 2006. So sometimes the organizing conference actually lead to the results you never expect what happened. And this guidance actually is very powerful. So finalized is 2010, and, and the trial I was involved in Boston Scientific, they, they're making the medical device. Also, as an unbranded 
in 2010, the trial was ended, uh, and the guidance also becomes public, the finalized. So these guidance provide actually on the statistical aspects of design and analysis of business clinical trials. And it lay out the detailed guidance on sample size determination called SSD in a basic clinical trial. And it also provides guidance on the evaluation of the operating characteristics of a basic clinical trial design, including type 1, type one error and the power. And this guidance actually set two of my work. So one's my 2000 paper, another one's 1999 paper. And so this is some of the, my work on basing SSD. So my 2011 biometrics paper was the kind of assembly what I did with Boston Scientific. So I was very grateful with my, you know, the real clinical trial experience. And the trial was real. So after trial completed, I thought I should summarize what I did for the, this particular trial. And the paper, the biometric editor was really love it. So they accepted almost right away. So this paper, the first time they lays out the basic methodology, you know, with a focus, a focus on controlling type one error and the power for non-inferiority trials. And after this work, so we extended this work with a group of engine statisticians who developed called the basic meta experimental design for non-inferiority trials. And we also kind of proposed the idea called the partial volume power product. And in 2014 SIM paper, so we developed another called sequential meta-analysis design. And the 2015 we developed SES macro, and this which can be used for business level meta experimental design using historical data. And in, in 2014, the biometric paper actually extends the methodology of the 2011 paper to design a clinical trial for the current events data. And in 2015, which is my another PhD student that uh, did uh, his dissertation, so we developed a methodology with the co prime endpoints and a multiple dose comparison. And in 2018, we developed the basic design using base factor. So the, those are, so pretty much the basic SSD, the load map, it's pretty simple. We started with the typical trial specification. And the you know, statistician often have the likelihood of function, which mathematical plays a role, and we have the model specification, and we have hypothesis from scientific perspective. And so likelihood will lead into posterior model also as well. So the power ply will come in to incorporate historical data, go through called fitting ply, feed into the posterior. So what historical data also can help us to make a decision rule much better. And the posterior also fit into decision rule. And with the hypothesis, we know how the data being generated, and that's called sampling plan. So once this all fit into together with decision rule, we can calculate the type of error and the power. And finally, we end up with what the sample size would be. So this is pretty much load map for basic SSD. So now I'll give one small illustration how powerful the basic design would be. And it's a very simple trial. It's a two arm trials. And we have a test device called treatment control device called control. We have the sample size called NTNC for these two arms respectively. And the goal of the trial is to evaluate the performance of new generational drug eluting stent called DES with a non-inferiority non comparison to the first generation DES. And the primary endpoint is binary called the target lashing failure, TOF, at 12 months of post stenting. And mathematically, we don't put that, you know, our interesting is the difference between the, 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 the TOF rate, PT, PC. So if PT minus PC, if greater than the pre special margin, then we can realize the new device is not safe. So if PT, Mass PC is less than principal margin, and then we have not only the new device will save, could be more efficient. So the, the trial will be successful if we accept the alternative hypothesis called H1. And the how to specify margin, there's a lot of clinical discussion based on the science. So in ideas within this margin, so the difference is, is not clinically 
noticeable. They're not indistinguishable. So PT and YPC. So those determined by coordination, not by statistician. And for this application was 4.1%. And they have, because of the, 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 the way we have the, you know, the medical device development, they always have different generations. So fortunately, when, when they want to test this new generation, they have the data from the two prior trials based on the previous generation, and the two articles published in New England Journal of Medicine and another paper published in the JAMA. And the data are really simple, really just four numbers. So in trial one, there are 44 events out of five, 35 patients. And the second trial was 33 events out of 304 patients. And that's the real historical data. And if we're based on the frequency that without using basin approach, the power calculation, it requires about 1,480 patients. So now if I do base, so how much it can help? So if we look at, uh, if I no borrow, so basin approach will be no different than the frequency approach. If I borrow 30% data from two plus trials, and the power will increase to over 80%, even with 1,000 patients. So this is practically very significant because for each patient, the Boston Scientific need to pay over $50,000. So essentially, we save them almost 500 patients. I didn't know they save so much money. At that time, I didn't charge money enough. They save a lot of money. So, so you can see that the Beijing sample size calculation with incorporated historical data lead to substantial reduction in the sample size and then still guarantee the successful of the clinical trial. So that's the beauty of the Beijing methodology. So finally, I will end up with uh, the go through few recent research on power apply. So I mentioned before the power apply was based on the compatibility of the data. And also we, we need to have a certain way to measure how much information we need again, right? Once everything was done. So this is a paper from my, another PhD dissertation and also co collaboration with Linko and Paul Lewis from EEB. So this paper was published last year. And this paper will also quantify how much, you know, how can tell these two data comparable or not. If comparable can borrow more, if not, it will borrow less. So it's a beautiful algorithm. The paper was a really nice paper. And the second one is also collaborate with the same group uh, with the Professor Lin Ko and uh, Paul Lewis. And this one, we use a different way to quantify how much different between two data sets would it be. So we have called basic information and basic dissonances. And uh, this one is another one. I, I mentioned before, we have partial borrowing. We're also borrowing by parts. So why can we combine together? And we, we did exactly like that. So this is another paper with my current PhD student, MD Tuchen Shek. And this is, so this paper in terms of complexity of data, because we have the two parts of data. We have longitudinal data with survival part. And the survival part of data, they're different follow-up. They change his, this is called code data analysis, actually not called historical data analysis. So if a code data have the different follow-up time, I may borrow the survival data information partially, but we may borrow the now the two data and the survival data differently, that's called borrowing by parts. So this is nicely putting together, we call partial borrowing by parts of power plan. So finally, we will apply our technique to leveraging real world data. So this is a paper we published, actually not published yet, just a set the few months ago. So this is kind of work with my current students, Eric Barron, and with collaboration with Sovia, the pharmaceutical company. And so this will pretty much conclude my technical presentation. And I would like to thank my collaborators for their contribution to this research, especially Joseph Ibrahim from UNC and Peter Lam, Boston Scientific. That's where I started from basing design of clinical trial. And Amy Shah from, from Amgen, which we did a lot of work for design of meta and meta design, like clinical trials. And John Tong, we will develop a kind of Quite a few different uh, the, 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 the design of the superiority trials. And same time, we just involved, I just showed the, the previous work. And then my, my colleague, Deepak Day, De, Linko, and Paul Lewis, and many more I cannot listen here. And what, uh, I would also like to thank all of 
of my former and current very talented PhD students for their hard work and contribution. And finally, you know, I um, really appreciate, you know, that the funding agency provide me the financial support. And I received uh, many, quite a few, you know, our one and also PO one in Archie grants and also NSF grants. And uh, also in the industry grants from Boston Scientific and Britain, uh, Britain Women Hospital, MG, Mock, Britain Ingraham Pharmaceutical, the Journal Bio, and Sylvia. And I think that that's what conclude my presentation. I'm not sure how many minutes I used. <laughs> you use what you needed, Dr. Chen. You use what you needed. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, hopefully everybody uh, can appreciate. Let's just say thank you. You know, for that, we much, much appreciated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so we're, we're open right now for, for Q&A, uh, for some questions uh, to Dr. Chen about um, the work that he has presented or the work in, in general. And I, I, I always like to get us started with at least one question, which uh, is getting increasingly difficult. <laughs> but what I understand, Dr. Chen, at the end of the day is that your work is efficacious to my wallet. And that's really, really important to me. Um, but you'll forgive me for asking a question that comes from the layman space of a, of a humanities person or an arts and culture person, a playwright. And, and for me, that is what is for you the next frontier, you know, beyond this research? What is the next area of research that you are um, interested in exploring that you haven't yet stepped into and, and why? Yeah, I think that the, the you know next arrow is right now because we're getting into the data science arrow. So that's a, it's the same thing. And also we have you know it's a massive amount of data available in the future. Mm -hmm. And so this is the current uh, that the something I started doing the research. You know how to develop uh, in, within the machine learning framework, and how to integrate uh, the, the the different sources of data, mm -hmm. data integration. And the research I developed in, in my career, I think it should be very helpful for extend to you know those areas for future research. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, what I hear in that is that there is no stopping, there's no end, um, you know, to how you collect. I think uh, students keep me going. <laughs> <laughs> and, by, and vice versa. I bet you're keep, you're keeping them going as as well, and that they can't wait to. To get into the lab with you and and to be um, on board with your research as well. Oh, I I see the number. I've heard a couple of times the number of PH student PhD students that you have supported and been the advisor for. So so clearly students are flocking because there's some exciting work going on. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that folks know the floor is open. Please um, you know don't hesitate to uh, to ask some questions and. Um, take advantage of Dr. Chen while we have him. Too technical. <laughs> <laughs> just a touch, Dr. Chen, just a touch. But you know what I also find fascinating? I'm, I'm going to throw this in there while people are gathering their questions, because I'm sure there is a million of them. They're just a little intimidated, as I am. But I want to tell you what I'm so fascinated by being a person who really enjoys and appreciates language. I, I often find that mathematicians use words like elegant and beautiful. Um, <laughs> and I, I don't normally associate those words, you know, with with mathematics. But I was telling a friend of mine earlier, I think I was telling um, um, Vice Provost um, Jeffrey Schultz and that I had written this play about chaos theory. Um, and in my research, I came across a lot of kind of sensual language as it concerns mathematics. And so this is ancillary to what you talked about, but I wonder if you you could tell me why I, I seem to run into that and you use some of that wording today. Yeah, actually those are a lot of wording. Thank you for this great question. So, you know, because of that, that being a statistician, right? So we kind of share something with the humanity in a way, when we're writing an article, it's not really sure the mathematics. Right? We need to tell the story. You know, why the problem we're working so important? Why the the, the methodology we develop so beautiful? Yeah. And, but not only that, right? we, when you tell people the work we have done is very significant. Yeah. And it will be impactful to the, the society, mm -hmm. will change people's life. Yeah. 
Well, yes. you know, being a storyteller, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so what really what I think beautiful story for the each work we have done. So that's mm -hmm. something I keep telling my students and we work very hard to achieve this. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. All right. Well, I'm gonna throw it out there one more time before we conclude. If you have any questions, you know, please don't hesitate or throw it in the chat. I see some congratulations happening, which are well due, well due. Um but it, but it looks like we're not. Oh, I see a hand up. Uh, yeah, I'll take it. Please, please. I, I, do. Have a, I, I can ask Ming uh, specific oh. questions because I understand what he's talking about. So <laughs> I, I have a So you were talking about a non inferiority trial, and you specify that the delta is being, in essence, set up by a story outside of statistics. So I'm kind of curious how this delta is being defined, how someone or who is defined, what is the delta? They, okay, so that's a tough question. So. That, that's, a, <laughs> that's a philosophical <laughs> question. Uh, so the, the delta actually is not exactly just designed by clinician, right? In the collaboration with a statistician, it, it's kind of uh, you combining the expertise and the evidence in a way. So for this particular case, right, if we, what, did they publish, if you bought some scientific, they published an article, so published in the trial article. In the article, they very particularly articulated how this data being determined. So for this particular work, actually, the data was negotiated between both scientific and FDA. So I was not involved for this particular determination. I was being told the 4.1% you should use. You cannot change. And in the literature, it's a combination of the evidence and the experts for subject matter to determine most scientific value of the, you know, not if, if you are to imagine. Yeah, it's always kind of hand-waving. There isn't a clear statement of yeah. how those numbers come up. Yeah, but every number, you know, we put this here, it's a, it's a very serious number, you know, not, we're not put the numbers here, you know, kind of liberally, because this is really matters of people's life. Yep. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I can only see so many folks uh, on my screen. That is the the, the lack of elegance of our virtual space that we are in. So if you have a hand up, I probably have missed it, but if you have a hand up, please, please go ahead, unmute and jump in. All right, well, I think one, one, one tough question a day, Dr. Chen, it's like an apple a day for the doctor. One qu tough question a day is all we're gonna roll with. Um, Listen, uh, congratulations once again on your um, distinguished professorship. Uh, thank you so much for coming in today and having this conversation with us. And, um, you know, have a great, great evening. Everybody, thank you for joining us and have a great evening. One more time, one more time. Clap it up, Dr. Chen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, have a, have a great evening. Thank you again for joining us.